am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to be? How should I live my life? What should I do with my life? What ideals should I follow and why those ideals? What's the purpose, the meaning, the point of my existence? In this book that we're covering, uh, World Religions, the editors have provided, or World Scriptures, excuse me, the editors have provided a sampling or samplings of, uh, from some of the spiritual texts of these major religions. They uh, are trying to say, that the editors are trying to say, look, the, what these religions are doing is trying to provide an answer to these questions. They're trying to provide an answer to the question, what is the purpose, the meaning of your life? Now, I, I want to... Now, now, I want to be clear, I'm not going to pay close attention to any particular passage. Right? Rather, I'm just going, in this video, it's just going to explain the major assertions that the editors think come from these uh, passages, from these sacred texts. Now, I also want to reiterate, the point of this video, and indeed the point of the whole course, is not to show or ask the question, which religion is right? I'm sure there's an answer to that. But that's not the purpose of this of this course. Instead, all we really want to do is to figure out what these religions claim. We want to understand these religions. I'm not even asked the question what justifies religions. No. I mean, just not even looking at them. The only point is to figure out what these religions have to say. And in addition to that, what demand do these religions have upon your life? What is the claim, the change, that these religions would have? The editors think that these, uh, that these passages give us some you know, main assertions, right? some answers to the questions, uh, to the question, what is the purpose of life? And, you know, probably the broadest terms, or broadest sense, uh, the, uh, the answer is basically this. Now, the purpose of your life is to follow the divine. Uh, and that the divine, or whatever this ultimate reality is, gives you that purpose, right? As opposed to, you know, getting it from yourself. That one who uh, follows the divine, somehow partakes or, or is changed by the divine to become more like the, the, the divine, to become more, to have more like a divine nature. And the book refers to such a person as a saint. And as a consequence of this, the saint uh, no longer pursues physical things, temporary things, uh, material things, right? No longer pursues those kinds of joys. And instead, the, the, the divine, oh, excuse me, the saint, becomes happy, right? Achieves fulfillment in uh, following the divine and partakes in the divine nature. So the first assertion that the editors address deals with happiness. The purpose of life as happiness. Now, uh, there, you know, there's something to keep in mind here <laughs> when we're talking about happiness. Uh, these religions have a, uh, make claims, they all pretty much say this, make claims as to the, the source of this happiness or what kind of happiness can be found. And we'll just kind of contrast it to what, what we call the mundane, mundane happiness or worldly happiness, right? So these religions will say, oh, okay, sure, you can pursue worldly happiness, but you know, what's that going to be? It's going to be some kind of object, right? Or something in this physical world. Right? And, well, what, what's going to be the good of that? Right? Uh, physical things deteriorate, they fall apart, they decompose. Right? Um, they only last for a little while. Right? Uh, you know, anything that you're trying to pursue that's just grounded in this world is going to be at best temporary. It could last a while, maybe. So, you know, suppose you're trying to make your mark in history. Well, like I said, well, look, yeah, you, you know, people might remember you, but they'll only remember you for a little while, and people always forget. Right? You know, eventually you will be forgotten. Mm -hmm. 
the, uh, any of these goals that you pursue in, in the world, or any mundane goals, um, sometimes they're pretty much just to satisfy fleeting emotional needs. But emotions and emotional desires, they're capricious. Uh, then, the, you know, if you satisfy them once, you're going to need to satisfy them again, right? You'll, you'll always be hungry if you pursue mundane goals. You know, in contrast, in contrast, these religions are claiming, you know, the editors say these religions are claiming, uh, the happiness that you're supposed to pursue is from the divine. It's supposed to be transcendent. It's not going to be found in the world. It's what's responsible for the existence of the world. Instead of being... Uh, you know, temporary, they're eternal. Instead of uh, capricious or fleeting, they're permanent. Instead of uh, what is, you know, uh, merely caused by ultimate reality, it is the self ultimate reality. So the first assertion the editors address uh, is the purpose of your life, and that's happiness. The second assertion the editors address uh, deals with the source of that happiness. Right? So the, according to the editors, these religions claim that the source of your happiness is from the divine itself. It's not from anything you deign. Uh, it's not from something physical. It's not for something temporary. It's not for something fleeting. It's from the divine itself. Since it's not from the world, since it's not from the beginning, your source of happiness, what brings you that happiness, right, is not you. Since the source of happiness is not mundane, right, since it's from the everlasting, the, the ultimate, what the book calls the ultimate reality, right, it's not from anything in this world. Uh, instead, according to these religions, the source of happiness is from the divine. And that's the only, meaning that's the only place you can find that happiness. The third assertion the editors address uh, deals with human nature and the divine nature. Now, according to all these different um, text, or at least according to the editors, what these texts are saying, is that there, uh, there is no opposition between the divine nature and the human nature. They're compatible. That means that in some way, right, the human nature is improved upon. It's not to say necessarily that humans are divine, although that isn't excluded with some of these possibilities, but that, uh, and it's not to say that, you know, Human nature is inherently flawed, although some do say that. Now, instead, what's being claimed here is that you could take the human nature and, and the divine nature, and, you, and the divine doesn't become human, right? uh, but instead that, the, that uh, the divine makes the human more like the divine. Rather, the point of these religions is, is for humanity to be elevated to something like divinity. Now, the, the details of this differ from religion to religion. Uh, but the main point here to remember is what these religions are claiming is that humanity is not opposed to divinity, and divinity is not opposed to humanity. Rather, uh, they can work together. The fourth assertion uh, is dealing with the human nature, pretty much just only the human nature this time. The last assertion dealt with the compatibility with the divine nature and the human nature. This one says that there's nothing inherently bad about the human nature. And in fact, you can go further to say the human nature is inherently good. Now, they all have something to say about how something goes wrong. If you know something didn't go wrong somehow, then you know humanity would kind of, I don't know, maybe automatically be elevated to divinity or something like that. 
Yeah, we probably shouldn't try to read too much into it at this point, other than to you know, speci specifically from the viewpoint of one's own religion. Right? Don't try to understand other religions in terms of yours. But the, the idea, I think what the editors are trying to get at, is that humanity has, for the human nature, humanity has the possibility of happiness. Humanity has the possibility of being one and united with the divine. Now, I said I didn't want to pay too much attention to any given religion, and, and, and I don't. But I'm going to take a little bit of a sidebar here, uh, just to deal with what's called the original mind or the no mind. Right? Now, this is uh, related to the earlier assertion about the inherent goodness of human nature. Right? And in the Eastern traditions, this takes on a different sort of uh, flavor to it. In the West, you would talk about innocence. right? Uh, purity or moral goodness of uh, of uh, human nature. Okay, that, that's fine. But it's not exactly what they're doing or how they describe it in, in the East. Now, this notion of the original mind or the no mind can be a little bit difficult to understand. So I'll, uh, you know, kind of take it from, uh, you know, kind of work backwards to the situation that, we, that we're currently in, right? So some of you might smoke. Some of you might have like a favorite dessert, but you know, it's like, like deep pangs for that dessert, like, oh, right? chocolate lava cake. Uh, some of you might uh, really be proud of, I don't know, uh, your car or an achievement, like, you know, a, a trophy that you won, uh, you know, winning a track meet or something like that. Okay, so these are all attachments. These are all things that you desire uh, of these, of the physical world, of these mundane things. These are all physical. These are all temporary. They're all fleeting. They will crumble. Now, that's not the original mind, right? That is you attached to things. So, uh, the original mind or the no mind doesn't know these things, doesn't want these things. Purged of these, the original mind is the, is the, is the self that's purged of these desires. Uh, and instead of desiring temporary things, mundane things, physical things, a person desires ultimate reality. When no longer, when the person no longer thinks of the self, of the ego, of the want, of the desire. They're detached from the world. And when they're detached from the world, they can be attached. They become one with what's ultimately real. So the next the next assertion that the editors deal with is the saint. Now, the editors use the word saint. Okay, it's largely a, a Western word, but we'll just ignore that for the moment. Um, now, I, it's, it's, what's important to keep in mind here is, is the uh, editors don't mean that the saint, you know, is somebody who is just better than you. Right? That's, that's not what's going on. That's not how the editors describe it. Instead, for the editors, the saint is someone who has achieved a significant measure of this divine nature. Now, l l let's just, to understand, I think, what the editors are trying to explain here, uh, imagine that y you've been offered a job. And this job, uh, or you have a job right now. Let's say you have a job right now. And this job is great. Right? You, you love your coworkers. Your coworkers are really great to work with. They're fun, they're cooperative. Nobody says a mean word to anybody. Uh, you love the work. Right? You believe in the work. You think uh, that the work makes the world a better place. It makes you a better person. Yeah. The pay is great. In fact, it's probably too much. You're a little embarrassed when you get paid too much. It's got great benefits. You have the best medical, a dental, retirement plan. Even the place where you work is beautiful. It's a joy to come in. They've got traveling art shows through there that just lift up your spirits, right? <laughs> Why wouldn't we all love to have that job? <laughs> 
And it's supposed along the way you, you know, you've been offered a, another job. And uh, the person who offers the job is like, yeah, well, you should work here because, you know, you should do what we say. You have to do what we tell you to do. You know, the pay stinks. Your coworker, you know, the potential coworkers, they're all kind of jerks. Uh, you're schluffed off to some meaningless task that, you know, actually doesn't do any good for the world or yourself. Right. Uh, no benefits, uh, long hours, have to work weekends, right? Why would you choose that second job? <laughs> so this is the position of the saint, right. according to the editors. The, the editors say, look, in all these different religions, they all talk about a saint to some extent. But what this means is that this saint has achieved a certain amount of this divine nature. And in doing so, right, the saint doesn't want anything in the world. At least not for that, its own purpose, right? A saint might have, what, nice clothes, but doesn't have nice clothes for the sake of having nice clothes. It has nice clothes for some other purpose. Right? Um, the saint, according to these editors, no longer desires anything in the world for its own sake. Why? Because the, the saint has already found the divine. So the last claim, the last assertion the editors address, it, it deals with the person who has achieved, has fulfilled the purpose of life, the purpose, the meaning of life. Such a person uh, has universal love. And universal love is you know, pretty much just that. Right? Uh, you, some of you love already, sure. You, know, you love family, you love friends, pets, Maybe you love your job, right? That's okay, sure, you, you, you have a measure of love. Right? But that's love for what's familiar or favorite. The, according to the editors of the book, those that have fulfilled this purpose of life have this love for everybody, not just familiar or favorite. At least for the familiar favorite, but not just the familiar or favorite. It is love of family. It is love of friends. It is love of the stranger. It's love of the enemy. For the according to the editors, what these religions are telling us is that in achieving this ultimate reality, in achieving and partaking in the divine nature, one loves all. So just a, kind of a closing note, uh, these are some bold claims. Right? Um, now, I'm not telling you you have to accept these claims. I'm not. Like I said, the point of this course is not to ask whether any particular religion is right. Uh, instead, we're just trying to figure out what, the, what these religions are saying. So yeah, if, let's assume that the editors are correct, that all these religions are claiming these from these passages. I'm not saying you have to now believe them. And kind of on that note, uh, I'm not even saying we have to take the editor's word for it that these passages indeed are making these claims. I, I find it difficult to believe that you could take a passage from any sacred text, or frankly any legal text, or any piece of fiction, or any or literature, or philosophy, and nicely sum up the exact assertion. And no. <laughs> uh, I have serious, doubt of, serious doubts that you can prove that any given source says this from, you know, even a page of, you know, in some of these cases these quotes are quite lengthy, but certainly not from single sentences, or five sentences, or paragraphs, or something like that. So, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not saying the editors are mistaken, right? I'm just saying we don't necessarily have to take them at their word. These are nice starting points. Right? We have the editor's assertion that these religions are claiming this. Okay, cool. But let's find out whether they are, in fact, claiming this. Uh, the point of this course is to understand religions, understand what they claim and what they want from us. Uh, and even if we start with, you know, a suggestion 
that the religions are saying this, in trying to investigate whether this suggestion is true, we will understand these religions better.